It says we're live. Is it actually working now? It's a good question. Let's pop over here. All right, let's do the sound check, tech tech, all that stuff. If you guys are live with us right now, I know we just sent that email out just a few minutes ago, um, letting you know that we're going to be live. But if audio is coming through, video is coming through, if you want to let me know. This is the first time using this streamer, so we'll see how it goes. Hopefully, it's going to be a good time. Work job. Hey, man. Hey, thanks. That's congrats for the win. I appreciate it. It was a real cool event. It was a lot of fun. Let me turn this audio down over here. I'm going to try to keep comments over on my phone over here so I can keep up and see them as we go along. So my name is Daniel. I'm the owner of Catfish Sumo. And um, what we're doing today on this live webinar is uh, recently there was the Sandusky Bay tournament for the online catfish trail. And it was the largest catfish kayak tournament in the nation. And um, I went up and fished it. We had sponsored a couple earlier events that were here in Chattanooga earlier in the year. And so I went up and participated in that one as a angler and um, won first place. It was an amazing experience, ton of fun, got to meet some really cool people. And um, we had some, some questions coming right before the event and a lot of talk with some people from the area who were wondering to know, Daryl wants to know, did the shrimp work? Hey, I will tell you exactly about that. So many people uh, mentioned shrimp as a potential bait, and I will tell you exactly how that turned out. And um, sneak preview is that I fished almost zero with shrimp on tournament, tournament day. And I'll show you exactly what I was using. Um, this, this for me is, is kind of a, um, uh, I mean, it's gonna be some training, but it's, it's kind of my gift back to the community a little bit is um, we, we talk a lot about in, um, uh, in what we do here. Um, with our team and our core values, but also a lot of the content that we put out online is that we believe that everybody can catch fish all the time and that anybody catching a big fish doesn't mean that somebody else doesn't get to catch a fish. And so we want to share as much information as we can. This was new water I had never fished before. Um, so I applied all the three, the three things that we teach, the three rights framework, the right spot, the right rig and the right bait and um, use that to win first place in the tournament. So we're going to be going through, I'm going to be going through exactly how I pre-fished, um, some interesting things that I noticed uh, during the pre-fishing that helped influence how I picked my spots for tournament day. I'm going to show you, uh, i got my rods right here. I'm going to show you the exact rig rigs that I was using uh, for the different spot, depending on what I was trying to do, um, and the bait that I was using. Um, so hopefully going to be a good time hanging out. I know that we we only sent this email out just to a small group, and I know we're catching people in the middle of the day. We told you last week uh, that we were getting it ready and just looking at scheduling. We weren't sure when we were going to be able to do it. So I wanted to go ahead and get it recorded, and we'll leave it up here probably a couple days um, for anybody that wants to watch the replay. And um, hopefully be some good information for you guys. And you'll be able to take the things that I teach. I mean, I mean, I was fishing a brand new body of water, right? I'd never fished there before. Um, had never really exclusively fished for channel catfish before. Um, so this was a brand new experience for me, new water, uh, new fish species to target specifically. Um, so I'm gonna show you exactly what I did. And I promise if you take those exact same strategies out to any body of water, you'll be able to catch big fish as well. Daryl says, Ben, the kayak didn't fish to the point on the opposite side of the bridge. Interesting, I'll show you. I'll show you exactly where I fished. I'm, I'm not, not like teaser hanging it out there, just, um, giving it a second for everybody to get that email and hop on if they're available. Um, there, there is a lot of good water up there. Um, for anybody who hasn't fished either out of a kayak or an online tournament before, um, so this is part of the online catfish, uh, online kayak, the OCT online catfishing tournament trail. Um, it's, it's one of their uh, kayak tournaments. Usually the way the kayak tournaments go is they can either be a dedicated amount of time or a dedicated spot. Um, usually there's boundaries, but you submit everything to the app. So unlike a boat tournament where a lot of times you're putting fish into a live well and then taking them back to weigh in, the way that we do it in catfish um, uh, kayak tournaments is that everybody has an approved measuring board that you have to get certified the day before the tournament starts. And um, the uh, judges check out that board. They measure it, check the angles, they approve it. Um, and then the day of the tournament, you get an identifier. Um, and then when you're fishing during the day, you have to take the picture of a fish and it has to be, you know, bumped on one side and the tail has to be a certain place and the fish has to be facing a certain direction. Um, you have to have that identifier on the picture. That's what keeps people from pre-fishing and taking pictures and submitting them later. And then the app that we submit them through, the judges can see 
exactly like GPS location of where you are and all that to make sure that nobody's cheating. That, that's kind of the best way right now um, that's been developed so far for how tournaments can try to prevent cheating is making sure you you are submitting the fish from the, the approved area that you hopefully caught that fish that day because you're taking the picture with the identifier that you got that day. Um, and there's cutoff hours and, and uh, things like that. Uh, let me turn off this phone here so it's not buzzing in the mic. Um, so it, it was a very interesting um, experience. It was, it was a ton of fun to go up and fish. Um, so uh, I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee, where we fish here is a lot of blue catfish, some flatheads, and, and a lot of big fish. We have channel catfish some, but not a whole lot. And had never, I'd never really specifically targeted them. Um, so going up to new water where there's only channel catfish um, was, was a cool experience and uh, something new for me. Um, so my goal was just to go, I'm going to apply the three rights framework, what we teach in all of our training. The three rights framework is the right spot, the right rig, and the right bait, and see how it turns out. And it turned out well. Um, so let me, I want to hop over to um, a map here, and I'm going to talk about the pre-fishing. So my strategy going up is I went up Thursday, or sorry, Wednesday. I fished a little bit Wednesday night. I fished Thursday in the morning, and then there were storms. Um, I fished Friday or am I off by a day? Did I go Thursday? Yeah. And then um, for Saturday, because the catfish, the kayak tournament was connected to a boat tournament, um, the boat tournament happened on Saturday and the kayak tournament happened on Sunday. Um, so they were not wanting us fishing in, in Sandusky Bay. There's basically two main bridges and that's where most people fish all the time. It's right between those two bridges. Um, so they didn't want any kayaks because of all the heavy boat traffic from the boat tournament. They didn't want any kayaks in between those two bridges. So I used that opportunity to go fish a different area. Um, and, and I'll show you exactly where that is. Um, so let's get started here. I'm, I'm going to talk about my pre-fish here for a second and what I did on the couple days leading in and, and uh, how that influenced, uh, excuse me, what I did the tournament day. So let me try, I'm going to hop over to this streamer. If you want to let me know if this is coming through correctly, hopefully you should see a map. See a map? Mostly a map? This thing resizes? <laughs> How did it feel to beat Justin by 10 inches? It was actually two inches, not, not 10. Oh, no, 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 sorry. I, I, I beat second place by, by two inches. Yeah, Justin had, um, uh, I mean, he caught some amazing fish too. There was a ton of great anglers there. There was people from Texas, um, some local people, us from Tennessee, some Ohio people, Indiana people, um, North Carolina. There was people from all over anglers uh, there fishing. And I mean, it's, it's it's an amazing experience. It was an honor to be able to fish it. Um, I feel proud to be able to have won it against some really, really good fishermen and women, fishermen and women, fisher people. So here's here's a quick, this is the first thing that I did, getting ready to, uh, to flip. Thank you so much. Let me see if I can. I'm going to open up this streamer. Flip horizontally, left to right. See if that shows up correctly. Let me know if that fixed it. Sorry, thanks so much uh, for letting me know about that. Didn't want this whole thing to be backwards. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, so this is the first thing that I did heading up before I headed up to the tournament was look at the bay. So just for some perspective, this is Lake Erie right here. It's a huge lake, one of our great lakes, right? And down here in the corner is Sandusky Bay. It's a lot of industrial all along here. Um, there's some feeder streams coming in a different place, a couple places. It's very industrial all along the bank, not very built up, not like houses and things like that, except for a couple areas. Um, but there is some influencing things are, um, there is some tide pattern that happens. Um, so, so influencing things are weather, of course, wind was a big factor because this was real wide, a couple miles all, all the way across here. Uh, tide was an influencing factor. Uh, and then temp water temperature, because um, we knew heading in that, that we were coming up on the spawn for, for channel catfish. Channel catfish usually spawn between the water temperature hits between 70 and 74 degrees. And the first day I pre-fished, it was 68 when I got in and about 72 when I got out. Um, so we knew that that they were headed towards spawn. And that, that uh, for me, was a big thing to think about in the strategy of where am I going to find big fish? Because the way that the spawn usually happens is as the water warms up, the females, which are typically bigger, uh, move into the spawning area and they start feeding real heavy 
and then pretty much they go uh, like stop feeding. They're working on getting ready to lay eggs. Um, they're uh, getting nests ready, finding their spot, all that kind of stuff. The males move in, um, spawn takes place, the females move back out. And for a day or two, they're pretty dormant still, but, but pretty quick, they pick up feeding real heavy again. Then the males move back out. So if you ever are in a place where you're noticing you're catching either like only females or only males, and I'll show you exactly how that happened on this map um, for me, um, then, then you can use that as, as, a, as a, an influencing factor of where to fish. Is if you're only catching males, it's very possible the females have already moved in or already moved out, depending on where you're fishing. Um, and, and that's what I noticed on, on uh, the day, especially right before the tournament. So this was Sandusky Bay. If you look at Navionics, by the way, these are free tools that anybody can use. Google Maps right here. I usually switch over to the GPS um, because sometimes you can see deeper areas. Um, you can also see a lot of like feeder creeks coming in. You can see parks and places where there's uh, potential places to either bank fish or, or get um, access to a boat ramp. Um, so this is what I looked at. And these are the two bridges right here. Let me switch back to this view. These are the two bridges right here where and anybody you talk to local, if you just want to go out and catch fish like crazy, I mean, like 200 fish days are not uncommon. Over those couple days, I've definitely caught hundreds and hundreds of fish. But most people are fishing between this railroad bridge and this highway bridge. And there's kind of a deep trench, which I'll show you on the Navionics. So Navionics doesn't have a very, or at least not, not in the free viewer without zooming in very far. Like this doesn't look like much. It just looks like a big, flat, shallow area. Um, but the reality is there's actually kind of a channel that cuts through from this bay entrance down here. It cuts kind of along this, this pink line. This is a navigation line. Um, so there is a bit of a deeper channel right along there um, that a lot of fishermen will fish. And then right between these two bridges, Oops, click out of here. Daryl says he's headed out there tomorrow. Awesome, man. I'll show you a good spot that worked a couple weeks ago. <laughs> you can tell me if they're still on there. Um, but most fishermen are, are fishing right between these two bridges. So I knew that ahead of time. I knew if everybody headed to that spot, then then we're just we're just kids at a fair game throwing coins or throwing rings trying to get on a bottle, right? If all the fish are there and all the anglers are there, everybody's just throwing coins, throwing throwing rings trying to get in the bottle. Um, which is fine. Um, I mean, then you're just, it's just a lottery, a lottery ticket, right? Um, but I, I really wanted to see if I could find something unique where not everybody else was, and I could apply what I know from other water to be able to go and uh, catch big fish. So the first day that I showed up, I fished out of this ramp. This ramp is called the, oh, let me look at the name of it here because I can't remember it. It's a public boat ramp. Let me see if Google Maps will tell me. Right down in here. Shelby. There we go. Shelby boat ramp. Um, and it is right down here. There's there's this big uh, like coal operation happening on the left side over here. So this whole, what they label as the break wall, is a big uh uh, like railroad trestle, and then there's there's uh, train cars dumping coal and things like that all up in there. So the first thing that I did is launch at this ramp and and fish some of this channel. This is the deepest channel in here. I figured if they're still in a little bit of that cooler water, getting ready to spawn, then they might be moving into this channel, ready to move up into this shallow water. Um, I noticed the temperature, water temperature, was a little bit low though. So here's what I did. Um, it was pretty rainy. Uh, sorry, pretty windy this first day. My initial thought was I wanted to get out on the other side of this breaker. And I wanted to hit some of these deeper holes over here that were marked on the map. Let's see, make sure my head's not covering these things up. Right in the middle of the screen, some of these deeper holes. There's lots of structure. Um, there's a submerged crib. This is where they uh, usually either pull or dump water. So it's got like a big cage around it. Usually it catches a whole bunch of sticks and that kind of stuff. So I was planning on fishing a lot over in this deeper area, but the wind just wouldn't allow it. I couldn't get the kayak out around here without taking too much water on. So I stayed on the inside of this breaker. And there's this little island strip covered in birds, which I thought was pretty interesting because uh, one thing about the birds is that they're usually picking up fish, hauling them back. They drop a lot. They tear them apart. And I was expecting maybe along this rock wall of this island to be covered in bait. And hey, where there's bait, maybe there's fish. So, so the first thing that I did is come up on this shallow area and anchored right about where this check mark is right here. Um, this, this is flat. It's about 20, 22 feet down through this deeper channel and moved up onto this flat, which Navionics says six feet is actually more like 10. 
um, but but anchored and then casted kind of four four or three lines is all you can use um, three lines out around me and started getting some smaller fish so um, it's pretty active fish i only had a couple hours to fish there lots of fish caught um, nothing very big though but I, so i knew there were fish there and a lot of them were males which was interesting um, but i knew that there were fish there which means the females the bigger fish had to have been close by um, so the two observations that I took from there were that, hey, I'm going to have to be aware of wind because I can't plan on tournament day being way out in the middle somewhere where, when it's supposed to be pretty windy that morning. Um, so I knew that I needed to find an area that was protected and I knew that I needed to find an area potentially a little bit warmer. So that was the first observation that I made pre-fishing tournament day. Um, the next day I went across to Dempsey boat ramp, which is over here. Um, what was interesting to me over here is that it's a big flat and it's kind of protected on almost three sides. Um, so this doesn't really look, I think it's about a mile from this boat ramp. Actually, I think we can find out right here. About a mile from the boat ramp where I put in, which is about here, out to like the tip of this island. Yeah, about a mile and a half out there. Um, so most of the morning, though, I fished. There's a big hump right in the middle, which which doesn't show on this, which was interesting to me. I was kind of hoping if, if anybody else was just looking at the chart, maybe they wouldn't have found the things that I found. But I found this real big hump where it comes shallow. Navionic says this is five, six feet. It's actually more like 12. And this hump right in the middle, maybe maybe this is what this marker is, is showing. Right up here near the middle is a big hump that came up to about four feet. Um, so I knew I wanted to fish that. But in the morning, I came over near this bank over here, and, and the bank drops down into about maybe five or six water, feet of water. And then where this row of numbers here, this isn't accurate. Um, this, this row of numbers right here, it drops down to about 12 or 14 feet, and there was gobs of debris in there, which was, which was the interesting thing to me, is that when I first put in, um, the water was a bit warmer. It was about seven, 69 degrees when I put in, and real quick, by about maybe 9 a.m., it was already 70, 71 degrees. Um, so I put in there and, and caught a lot of fish, caught a lot of uh, probably the biggest one that I caught there was close to 30 inches. But the observation that I made, two things. First is most of them were female. And so I was thinking, OK, if the, if the females are headed towards spawn and we're probably one or two days away from the spawn at that point, the females are headed towards spawn and they were hungry. They were fighting hard. And a lot of those fish, the, even like the 25, 26 inch channel cat fish, caught in 12 feet of water was fighting harder than a 30 inch blue that we might catch out here on the Tennessee River down at 70 feet. So it was a ton of fun to fish, caught tons of fish. Um, but but I knew that I wanted to target where the females were feeding heavy right before the spawn. So I found these spots where they would potentially be spawning and all of this debris all up and down this bank and fished just outside of that. There was, um, I, I went over it with side scan and marked a bunch of rock piles. Um, what, what, I, what I really wish, what's frustrating me right now is that is that I had GoPro footage all from my pre-fishing all the way up to tournament morning. At tournament morning, I uh, got about an hour in and my GoPro died and it's bricked. I can't get anything off of it right now. So I wish that I had more to show you from uh, screenshots of my, my side scan and the fish that I was catching, what I was observing on the top of the water. And I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have that here. <laughs> Um, but so this was day two pre-fishing. I caught a lot of fish here and a lot of them were female. That was that was in interesting observation number one. Interesting observation number two has to do with my bait. Um, and I'll, I'm going to go through at the very end exactly the three rods that I used, how I rigged them and what bait was on each one. Um, but what, an interesting thing I noticed uh, in this area is somebody had told me that there was um, that there are perch, which uh, the catfish like to eat, that there are perch that a lot of times are in this bay. They said usually earlier in the spring, but sometimes um, as the water warms up, there's still some hanging out right in this cove between Johnson Island and Dempsey Ramp. And so I fished, I'll show you this on, on the actual rig in a second, but I fished with a bait stalker stinger fly only on my rig. No, no chunk bait ahead of it, just the stinger fly. And on this day, over the half the fish that I caught were caught on this artificial um, no scent, nothing there, just the artificial fly um, of, a, of a perch pattern. So that was the other interesting that I, thing that I noticed was that so many fish that I caught were chasing down perch and hitting them hard. So I figured, great, this is awesome. This is the females are getting ready to protect nests and they're hungry getting ready for the spawn. So I'd found females, I'd found structure and I found a bait that they were, that they were liking. But only one of the fish that I, was, that I caught that day was up close to 30. 
So I put in the back of my mind, okay, if I can't find anything else, I'll probably come back to this area because I know there's fish and, and one of them was pretty decent. And if there's more like this in the area, if I fish here all day and just keep on top of them, surely I can find some more. Um, so the next day, oh, well, the next day was, was a uh, storm day. So storms moved in ha about halfway through that day. That was Thursday. Uh, and then Friday was super stormy. Um, so Justin and I went bank fishing, caught some carp. Um, what was great about the rod that I was using, the golly whopper, is that I just used my same rod and I bolted on the ba bank handle extension so I could surf cast um, and, and bank fish for those couple, for the, uh, about half a day that we fished out there um, and had a lot of fun. But I wasn't getting time on the water chasing catfish. And that was the thing that I really wanted to do. So the next day was Saturday, the day before the tournament. And honestly, at that point, I was feeling kind of frustrated. Like I should have just come up here the day before, fished a little bit, found some fish and just sat on top of them. Um, but what I found on Saturday was the thing that, that gave me the, 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 sure, the uh, more surety of where I wanted to fish. And here's what I did Saturday. There's a rumor that Sandusky Bay had at one time flathead catfish in it. Uh, and and up and further up into the Sandusky River, there are flathead catfish. Um, not huge, but there are some up there. Um, so I initially put in the, the day before the tournament. You know, this is where we weren't allowed to be between these two bridges. So I put down here at the Marina Bay Harbor. Um, and what's interesting about this area, related to finding the right spot, is if you're looking at these topo maps, find things that you notice on here, but then go verify them. Run side scan over them, check depth. If you don't, you don't even have to have electronics. Just drop your line down and check depths as you, as you head along a straight path. Um, and this entire basically like line from this marina all the way back to this inlet is about four miles, I think. Let's check it. All the way up to where this inlet comes in. Yeah, pretty much about four miles um, is entirely flat completely flat. I couldn't find hardly a thing on my side scan, but it was packed with fish, gobs of fish up in there. Um, I don't know that all of them were catfish because I dragged baits over a lot of them. I knocked some of them pretty much on the head and caught some catfish, but they were either dormant catfish, like headed towards spawn, pre-spawn, maybe spawn, um, but they were just static, not chasing anything down, not hitting baits very hard. Um, but it was warm down on this end. It was much warmer. In the morning when I put in, I think it was 73 degrees. And by the end of the day, it was, it was almost 76, 75 or 76 by the time I got, got out. So much warmer water down on this side of the bay, which is interesting to me because I expected this creek to be pushing through and pushing fresher water in that might be a little cooler. But in reality, I think the influence of Lake Erie and the current moving in and out um, is, is influencing the water temperature more on that opening end. This is making sense, hopefully. If there's any, ever, any questions you guys have along this way, put them in the chat. And, and I know that um, I know that a lot of people will be catching this on the replay. So I'll come back and check comments later if there's anything that I can answer. Um, so quick refresher, fished this bay right here real deep. Didn't find anything deep. Fished in about 12 to 15 feet of water, a little bit warmer. Caught a lot of fish, just nothing very big. Day before the tournament, I went out into this flat area and I saw tons of fish, but I didn't catch a whole lot. So I, I had a, a quick a quick um, idea right near the end of the day is that on Navionics, it shows a pretty deep channel coming in through. <laughs> None of this makes sense. Continue. Great. <laughs> uh, I, I hope it makes some sense. I hope that some of this is, is helpful to anybody fishing Sandusky Bay or strategizing how to fish any other place. Um, so I checked deep water, I checked mid water, out here I checked shallow water, and I marked lots of fish, but I didn't catch a lot. So my thought was, what if I can get up into this creek, and what if there are some flatheads up in that area? Because remember, for, for tournament day, it's five biggest fish, and the state record in Ohio for channel cats like 41. We knew that probably the top couple places would be five fish over 30 inches, but supposing I could luck into a decent, even mid-sized flathead, man, that, that would take big fish and it put me in a great place for, for first place. Um, so I came up into this channel and unfortunately, a lot of these deep holes that Navionics shows just don't exist anymore. They show a lot of this out of the water and it's not. They show some deeper holes down in here, down to like uh, 13, 14 feet, and they just aren't. They aren't there. 
Um, so this is pretty much flat, a couple feet deep, five to six feet deep all the way along here. I dragged the bait, I drifted, caught some more fish up near the channel, more than I had out in that big open flat, but nothing that was that promising. And I also wasn't sure that I wanted to make a four mile hike from the boat ramp up to the entrance to have lines in the water at 7 a.m. and then have to sacrifice at the end of the day to get off the water early to be able to make it back to the check-in of the tournament. Um, so, so that was kind of my big findings from, from the pre-fish was that water's, water temp is warming up and females seem to be hungry um, and, the, and potentially some of them were already headed towards spawn in the warmer areas. So I knew I wanted to find cooler water for a tournament day. I wanted to find deeper water, but not in those deep, deep channels. And I knew that I wanted to find something that was protected because um, wind direction in these couple days got, got pretty rough. And the day that I pre-fished around this island, um, the wind was coming from the south and it, it was kind of a saving grace to be able to be protected by this island on the upper side. I did make it around this backside when it was real windy and I realized I would not be able to fish there tournament day. So the things that I was looking for are fish, active fish, near structure, and where I can be protected. Um, so ultimately for, for tournament day, I ended up launching out of Dempsey ramp right here. And at, as a quick highlight, I, I fished along Giants, Johnson's Island here the first part of the day. And the second part of the day, I moved around down here and I'll, and I'll tell you exactly why. So here's a summary of tournament day. Hopefully all of that pre-fish made sense. You understand the things that I learned and the things that I observed. Here we come to tournament day. Lines can be in the water at seven. So I got on the water a little bit earlier, had my bait cut up, things rigged and ready to go so that right at seven, I could drop lines in the water. And it was, I, I went back and checked on my phone where I submitted the first fish and it was three minutes, three minutes after the after seven o'clock that I, that I had the first fish in the boat. And it was active, it was on fire, absolutely on fire. But here's something I noticed. Most of the fish that I, were catch, I was catching tournament morning were male. So let's think for a second. You can throw it in the comments. What might you suppose if two days before a bunch of females had been in here and tournament day, it's pretty much all male fish. I'm going to wait for a comment here. I know that there's some a little bit of delay, but what do you suppose might be happening or, or what might you, what conclusion might you be able to draw from that observation? While you're putting in the comments here, I'll tell you the second thing that I noticed was that the morning of the tournament, as I was heading out um, just before first light, um, there was a mad, uh, mayfly hatch going absolutely nuts. They were all over my kayak, casings all over the top of the water. Absolutely crazy amount of mayflies, which is good news for fishermen because when the, when the fish are, when, when that kind of hatch is happening, those fish go nuts, hungry or not, they're gonna be chasing that thing down. As a, as a, my background is trout fishing, it gave me a little bit of worry though, because when the trout are locked in on one particular hatch, you're not gonna catch them on any anything else. They are zoned in on that exact fly. And that's pretty much the only thing they're gonna eat. So I don't know whether catfish are that particular about, about the hatch like that, but it did give me a little bit of concern, but I knew that there was food in the area, which is good news, because when there's food in the area, there's gonna be fish in the area. Joe says spawn spawn that is exactly it so so my concern or 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 yeah it was, a, it was a bit of a concern that day was rats what if between those couple days and this water warming up the females have moved into full spawn and we're not going to see any of them um that was a worry um so so what i did tournament morning um and i found out later that in the boat tournament day, the day before five of the top 10 boats fished in this area so that was interesting to me that some of the top anglers who, who ended up placing at the boat tournament the day before, um, this just confirms the decision that I made uh, when I found that out later, was that this was the right spot, that the people who were fishing between the bridges, they caught some fish and some big fish were caught, but, but a lot of them started here and ended up moving out because the fish were just not in that deep channel. Um, they were headed up into the spawn. So for tournament day, what I did, this is the exact spots that I fished and exactly how I caught fish, um, is until about 11 a.m., it was absolutely on fire. Fish after fish after fish after fish. The thing about that, the, you know, having to submit them is that you got to make sure that fish is tired before you bring it in the boat. If you lay it on your measuring board and try to take a picture, like standing up, looking down at your measuring board, those fish are jumping all over the place. You might lose one. You might lose your fish grips. Uh, it, it was like, it was chaos <laughs> is what it was. It was a ton of fun, but it was chaos. 
uh, for a bit. Sometimes having multiple fish in the boat at a time, trying to trying to figure out which one's longest, which one do you need to submit. Once you've submitted your first five, if you submit an additional fish, if it's longer than one of those, it'll drop the bottom one off. If it's not, then it just it, it doesn't even go through. Um, but but you can kind of pre-cull that on your own by knowing, okay, my bottom fish for most of the day was maybe 25, 26, 27 inches. So if it wasn't longer than that, it's immediately getting released and I'm rebating and going, and going right back. Um, some strategy just for you guys who do fish, fish um, tournaments is um, a lot of it's about efficiency, finding fish and getting on them. But then when you're on fish, get that fish in, make sure it's tired out, get it in the boat. And I would rebate right then and get that rod back out, then take care of the fish that was in the boat. Um, if, if it's real hot and the fish are having a hard time recovering, I wouldn't do that. But these were very act active fish, had no problem taking off. And so it was, it was really unhook a fish, put the bait right back out, work on taking that picture. By the time you got that picture done, another rod's going down. It was, it was nuts. It was a ton of fun. I, I wish that I had truly counted. I wish they had the GoPro footage to go back and actually count exactly how many fish, but I, I bet it was over 50 or 60 fish just in that one day. Um, so first observation there that I made, water temperature is warmer and I'm catching males. Some of them were okay. I think I got my first maybe 29 inch fish there, but I wasn't seeing the big headed females that I'd been seeing there just a couple of days before. Um, so I fished pretty heavy. There was a couple, a couple, two other kayak anglers who, who went straight out to that hump. Um, they had fished the boat tournament the day before and had found that hump and it had produced for them. So they went back to that hump. They caught some good fish there too. Um, I was much tighter up on this bank, um, uh, just kind of going spot to spot of all of the debris that I had found the day before or a couple days before and marked on my side scan, fishing the rock piles, fishing the, um, uh, big logs that I had found submerged because those are the kinds of places that, that I expected the females to be hanging out getting ready to spawn. Um, so until about 11, now this was Father's Day, so uh, some some environmental influencing factors were mid-morning, it got crazy with boaters, boaters all over the place, and it, and it was rough, rough water from the boats and the wind started to pick up. Um, so by about 11 a.m., the bite for me, it almost entirely cut off. I probably went about two, maybe two and a half hours with not a bite um, and, and something just, just switched. Um, so I started thinking, what are the things that are going on? Um, and this is a strategy that you can use. Um, so water temperatures up. The females seem to be have either, either gone fully dormant, getting ready to spawn or have moved somewhere else because I'm just catching males. The males were still active and still feeding when I caught them, but something happened where all of a sudden the fishing was just dead. I wasn't marking fish, I wasn't catching fish. Um, so I knew that at that point, I think I was maybe in third place and pretty soon was dropped down to about fifth place because some other people by then they're, they're, they were submitting fish. And you never know strategy of the people catching fish, but, but my thought was, okay, if people who are in the deeper water now are starting to submit fish who weren't submitting them earlier, that that's where the fish have moved. Additionally, I really wanted to get out of this wind because this wind was really beating me up. I was taking a lot of water in the boat. And, um, and check this, when, when my rods were suspended, I'll show you my suspended rig that I was using, but when my rods are suspended straight out and my kayak itself is probably moving at least a vertical foot from those waves, uh, from the boat and from the wind, my, my lever of a rod way out here was probably moving four or five vertical feet which means my bait down at the bottom is moving at least four or five vertical feet, sometimes probably getting pitched up even more. Um, so if I'm, if I'm these fish who are becoming a little bit more dormant, getting a little more picky, probably not going to be chasing a bait up and down five feet trying to get that thing, right? Um, so the first change that I made was I switched my rigs. And I'm going to show you the rigs, rigs that I switched to, but instead of being suspended, I switched to all bottom, um, basically a dragging setup, but I was anchored and just casting rigs out. Um, and immediately, like, like within minutes after doing that, even in the spot where I wasn't marking fish, after I did that, I started getting fish again. Um, so I realized that the fish probably are tighter to bottom. They're not as active chasing bait down. And they're definitely not chasing my bait down that's, that's flying you know, every couple seconds, five, six feet up and down and up and down and up and down. So I knew that I needed to do something else with my rig and I really wanted to find a different spot in this area um, that I could still fish without sacrificing travel time and be able to uh, find more fish. Because at that point, 
I, I didn't have a shot at big fish and I was, I think I was about fifth place with just a couple hours to go. Um, so what I did is I had noticed during pre-fish this additional rock point out here. And off the end of this island, this is very, very rocky. So up, up here where I was fishing, it's mostly mud bottom with some rock piles that maybe had been pushed out when, when they worked on this bank and lots of logs. But over on this area, it was all rock. And right in here, I'm going to switch over to the GPS view so I can show you exactly right between a couple of these houses. Let's turn on GPS. There is a bit of a trench off of this point. So you see this point right here, a couple houses down, there is, there's a, a shelf. It's kind of a ledge where if you're traveling north to south, it's probably seven or eight feet deep. And all of a sudden it drops off into about 22 feet. So just like if, if there was no water, it would just be kind of a plateau and then a cliff. And then underneath that, a whole bunch of rocks. So I started dragging. I, I had that area in my mind because I found it the day before. I knew the fish potentially were moving deeper. I also wanted to be protected from wind. And when I came around this corner, what was interesting is that this bank was getting beat by waves, just absolutely beat. It causes a lot of turbulence. It stirs stuff up. Sometimes that helps encourage the bite because it stirs stuff up and there's more bait in the water. But, but imagine this underwater cliff like this, and the waves are pushing this way, and all the water is getting pushed all up against that. All of that bait that gets stirred up gets pushed right up at the bottom of that cliff. So that's what I had in my mind, and I knew that I wanted to go find that spot again. So I went, turned on side scan, headed down here, and, and, and this is where I caught my biggest fish. It was a 34-inch channel catfish. As I started dragging lines behind me and going moving, um, it's kind of like southwest to northeast right along that ledge on the bottom end of that cliff. And that's where I, I caught my first pass over that area, caught the 34-inch uh, uh, channel catfish. As a, as a side note, I was pretty nervous about submitting fish uh, through this app. This is the first time that I had used Fishing uh, Fishing Chaos, which is the app that this tournament trail uses. And um, I had checked with the tournament director the day before, sent him some sample pictures like, hey, I want to make sure that I don't submit all my fish and get to the end of the day and realize that I did something dumb and, and uh, didn't, didn't follow one of the rules exactly and my fish get disqualified. So I caught that fish, I landed it, I photographed it, I had it in a net. Which, by the way, pro tip, a net is absolutely essential when you're fishing these tournaments because there are so many fish that you get up to the to the boat. You want them to be tired out, so you don't really want to pull them right into the kayak like you might do normally and, and just unhook them and let them go. You need them to be tired out to get them on the measuring board, um, but you don't want to lose them. And so having that net, being able to net them and just leave them in the water next to the boat, and I would tuck, tuck the handle underneath my leg and just let them sit there for a minute, was, was critical. It, it saved me a lot of fish. So I measure that fish, I, I put it back in the net, I tuck the net under my leg and uh, called the tournament director and said, hey, can you please uh, look at this fish, judge it real quick because I don't wanna let this fish go. At that point, I, it might've been the longest fish or maybe second longest in the tournament, which is what it ended up being tied for second um, for longest fish. Um, I didn't want to let that fish go and potentially miss out on on the biggest fish that I had caught that tournament. And plus that that is the fish that moved me up into first place where I where I remain for the rest of the tournament. Um, and the other just kind of fun thing that happened is there was there was a family uh, real close. I mean, where I was fishing was was really, really close to the bank. This this thing drops off really fast coming off the bank of these houses. And they had seen me going by and, you know, give a little wave and, and I could hear everything they're saying. They could hear everything I'm talking to the camera about. And, um, uh, you know, hey, yeah, doing a, doing a catfishing tournament, all that, good luck. Uh, they're doing a Father's Day picnic out there. I told them, yeah, I hadn't caught anything for a while, hoping to get a good fish. And as soon as I landed that big fish, I anchored in that spot or spot locked in that spot and put my other lines out. And for the rest of the tournament, I didn't have a second where I didn't have at least one, usually two, most of the, sometimes three fish on those lines. Because I would put three rods out, I would reel one in, unhook that fish, measure it real quick. Most of them you know, weren't big enough to get up onto my board. A couple of them were. Um, and and uh, so unhook that fish, rebate, put it back out, let that fish go. As soon as it hits the water, nearly another fish is on it. So then I rotate to the next rod, bring that one in, unhook the fish, put it back out. A fish hits it, rotate to the third rod. It was just absolutely chaos. And I, I just kept looking at the people on the shore and they're cheering and, 
that hey, he's got another one. Look, look at him. He's got another one. This one's bigger. He's fighting it. He's fighting it. At one point, you know, fish wrapped around multiple lines, just total disaster. But I just thought, yeah, here we are. We're putting on a clinic today for this family uh, who's having their Father's Day celebration. Um, but but that was where I stayed for the rest of the day was um, uh, fishing in that area and moved back and forth, dragged a little bit back and forth, um, but mostly on those rocks. And and um, so the, the thought process then is, OK, the females and the fish have moved off of this hotter water. The females probably not fully spawning yet, but still in that hungry period, but they're not right here. Um, so they're getting ready to find that structure. They had moved just off that cliff, maybe because of the water temperature, maybe because of all of the turbulence and things, but had moved just outside to that next protected area, which was that big uh, underwater cliff. And that's where I caught fish after fish after fish for the rest of the day. I, I hope that's helpful for finding a spot. So the general principles of finding, of finding a spot are, are uh, finding a spot that is near where the fish live, near where they eat and has a highway in between. The highway in between especially applies to lakes with big underwater channels, and especially applies to rivers. Um, channel in between, I got a doorbell. Do you mind answering that? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, channel in between is it, harder to find on these big flat mud bottom mud bottoms, um, but finding any structure along there that the, that the fish use to navigate is really helpful. So this water or anywhere else, look for that when you're looking for a, spate, uh, a spot. Next principle is the right rig. We'll go over the right rig. I'm going to actually tie them up in the right bait. Um, the bait that I used that was, that was um, uh, interesting to me was that artificial. I caught over, like across the whole time, I caught over half the fish, eh, probably around half the fish on this stinger fly. By itself, no chunk bait ahead of it, just the stinger fly. And I'll show you how I rigged that one up. Um, the other baits that I used tournament day, I had some skipjack and I had um, a shad. I, I had caught a shad on shrimp. <laughs> so in that way, the shrimp did help me. I, um, up near the boat dock the day before, I had caught a shrimp, or, or sorry, on shrimp, I had caught a big shad. And uh, that, was a, that was a great bait. I felt good using that bait because it's native to the water. Of course, the best bait is native to the water where you're fishing. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's really, uh, the key thing for that one is that it's native. It's what the fish are already eating. I think that's the reason the stinger fly worked especially well too. That perch pattern was because it mimics what the fish were normally eating in this area, the, um, those perch. So let me go over the rigs real quick here. I have my three rods and I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to tie one and I'll just show you exactly how I rigged the others. Um, how I rigged everything up in case you want to um, use any of these. Um, I, I'll make this promise. We make this promise in all of our training is that what I'm going to be using is Catfish Sumo gear, but you don't have to. You can use anything with any name. I'll use the principles that we're teaching. Tie rigs the same way. Use the same principle when you think about your rig and the length and how it's going to present in the water and if it'll get you hung up or if the fish will be able to see it. And it's going to present bait naturally. Um, but who cares what the brand name on it is on it? Go out and catch big fish. Um, so let me show you the three rigs. I'm going to switch this camera back here. Come back over to that one. And let me pull back up the live stream here. I've been watching comments over here for you guys. Got it. So yeah, Daryl, there's the answer about your shrimp. Um, is, that, is that I did catch some fish on it during the pre-fish, um, but, but ultimately tournament day, I didn't use shrimp hardly at all. I had, I had one on a dragging rig early on but um, I switched over entirely to the natural bait from the area. Shrimp surely absolutely catches fish there. It's easy to get. You can run to Walmart and get it on the way, but anytime you can use natural fish from the water that you're fishing, that's, that's what you should start with. All right, so the three rigs that I started with, um, I had three methods when I was looking for fish. I wanted a suspended rig. I wanted a bottom rig that was a dragging rig or, or casting in, when I was anchored rig and I wanted a fly, singer fly. Um, so the suspended rig, uh, we showed this in a lot of our other trainings and things. It is very simple. You take your main line here. I guess I didn't need the actual rig, actual rod here to show you this. Suspended rig for me is, is extremely simple. The lead goes on your main line. This I'm using 80 pound braid. This is an eight ounce sinker, which is what I use in the river. Probably I could have gotten away with maybe six ounces. Um, 
at Sandusky just because we weren't dealing with current. But the X anchor goes on. I use a knot protector. Is there a silicone knot protector? Careful when, when you're getting knot protectors, um, uh, get something that is marine grade material. Um, you can grab stuff like, like coax um, grommets and things like that. Um, they're just not rated for underwater use, so they rot real quickly. And then after that, um, I used pre-tied rigs because I needed something real fast and real easy. It's what I like the best. So this is about 12 inches a liter right here. A bearing swivel. I use a bearing swivel because a bare roll swivel does not turn under weight. That matters more when you're fishing really big fish, big blues, big flathead, big blues especially because they roll. That's their, that's their defensive mechanism is to roll. But barrel swivels don't spin when they're under pressure which means you may as well not have it on there because it's not going to do you what you need to do when you're fighting a big fish. Um, these are already tied. If, if you're tying your own, this is an easy snow. Um, there's videos on YouTube. We have some videos, videos on our website, videos on the kayak course, uh, videos on YouTube. Um, easy snow, piece of cake to do, but always make sure that your line is exiting your eye facing forward. The reason is that once there is pressure on this, what it's going to do is rock that hook forward and, and tip the hook back to make sure you get a good hook set. Um, I use a polymer knot right here, which I'm not sure that is worth wasting y'all's time to even to even tie the knots here, but I'll, I'll show you one and then the others, I'll just show you how I rigged it. If you need to know the polymer knot, same thing, look on YouTube. Super simple, but it's the strongest knot for braid. Um, a trilium knot or things like that will uh, slip out. Um, so pull that through, cinch it down, and this is what I fished most of the tournament pre-fishing and the first half of the tournament day, all the way up until those waves. Um, let me grab these snippers and I'll, I'm going to demonstrate for you exactly why I switched off of this rig once the once the waves had kicked up. Is that imagine this as a lever? You know, this is I'm fishing this horizontally out of my kayak, right? So this is now seven feet away from my kayak, and if my kayak is moving up and down one foot. And this thing is moving like this, just that one foot pivoting and pivoting and pivoting. My bait is going absolutely nuts under the water every few seconds. Um, hey, Bob, how's it going? Thanks for joining in here, man. Good to see you. Um, that bait for, for fish that are not active, they are not going to chase that down, which is exactly what I experienced. Um, but this is an absolutely easy rig. Some version of this, this would be called a Carolina rig where your sinker's down here. I like this because you have direct contact with your bait, especially for channel catfish, which can be finicky. They munch on your bait and stuff. They're not uh, as predatory. They're not chasing stuff down and nailing it as much, especially when you're using dead bait like shrimp, like cut bait. Um, it's essential to be able to have direct contact with those fish. If this is, sink, if this is sitting on bottom or if you're suspended, as soon as that fish moves your hook, you want to know. Um, you need to know immediately because channel catfish will sit there. I mean, if they're sitting here, if this is sitting on bottom and this is connected to your main line, this fish can move all of this distance without you ever even knowing it. But when that line passes through your sinker or use a um, sinker slider, if you're using cannonball weights or something like that, make sure that you have direct contact with that fish so that the second, ooh, the, shark, the second that that fish moves your line, you know it um, and you can set that hook. So that's the suspended rig that I started with. If the if the wind hadn't picked up, I would have stayed with that rig the entire day. Um, but that was fit, uh, rig number one. That's why I switched off of it was when the wind kicked up and there was just too much turbulence moving my bait around too much. Rig number two that I did keep the entire time was this stinger fly. And the way that I rigged this stinger fly, I take a tip from Justin Johnston. Is I oh I know it's full yeah so rather than taking the time to show you guys all these knots I'm gonna I'm gonna take you through the rig and then you can tie it up on your own I have my la main line coming down I put a one ounce uh, egg sinker on there I use these with the uh, line protecting insert in between I got this juice right now I'm, hands are shaking because I'm on camera. <laughs> I should just cut this again so that it uh, slides through better. Whoops. See, this is why I don't do lives much. My hands start shaking and then I get nervous, but I appreciate all you guys being here. 
All right, so a one ounce egg sinker with a line protecting insert that way, especially for, um, this is a top rig, so I'm gonna have a float on here coming down to this sinker. So as that's moving up and down, you wanna make sure to have protection between the lead and your uh, line. So either use, <laughs> look who's here, kayak catfish. Amateur, that's exactly right. And you're the one to say it because you are the professional, not me. <laughs> uh, thanks for being here though for a second. I'm just telling everybody how I stomped your tail in that one tournament but uh, you can tell your part. <laughs> um, anyway, so line protecting the insert protects your line. You can use a sinker slider or something else instead. After that, I put a swivel. After that, I put about three feet of mono. This is 88-pound uh, mono down to my stinger fly. If I was fishing in the Tennessee River and I'm suspended or dragging, I would put a chunk bait in between there. So I would probably go maybe 10 inches or 12 inches to a piece of chunk bait and then another 10 inches off to the stinger fly. But because I wasn't fishing chunk bait near this and I was just suspending it, all I had was the stinger fly, which is what's so astounding to me that, that half the fish that I caught were on that fly right there. Well, not this exact one. That one's dirty and smelly. <laughs> but this, this pattern is what I caught so many fish on. Um, once you have that tied, then you add your float, which you can use a whole bunch of stuff. I took a tip from Justin Johnson. 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 Um, and I blow my balloons up about like this. Just about that much, enough that it is halfway submerged in water so the fish can still pull it, still move it around. You don't want a big giant one, the wind's gonna blow it all over, the fish won't be able to move it, they'll feel that tension immediately. Um, and then I just tie it overhand right onto my main line. So take it like that, tie an overhand knot, including your line in there, did I miss? Just like that. Now, what was super fun about fishing this is that is that I had this suspended. I was fishing in about 12 feet of water. You have enough head air to fill a pack of balloons. Thank you, Justin. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I, had the, uh, I was fishing at this point in about 12 feet of water, and I had this suspended down about four feet. Um, so about two feet of my main line, and then about two more feet down of leader line down to my uh, stinger fly. What's fun about the balloon is that since the fish are up higher in the water column when they hit this, Sometimes, you know, they don't feel it, you, you don't feel them pull down because it's just kind of floating out there behind you, you know, maybe not, not as tight of a line here because the wind's blowing it all around. But as soon as they hit, like you might just notice out of the corner of your eye, sometimes I'd be reeling in a fish over here and over here my balloon would just be moving, moving, moving. It's up around the front of my kayak, like, yeah, that's definitely a fish on there. And then you set the hook and, and have a good time. The other thing that, that uh, if you get a really active one and it's pulling that down, you'll just hear it behind you because the water... Yeah, like the buoyancy of the balloon, most of those channel catfish couldn't sink this thing. Um, so the, the buoyancy of the balloon held it, and you would just hear, I don't know if this will make the same sound. No, I guess the line has to be wet. But when your line's wet and this thing starts sliding, it's like, and you just hear this balloon sliding up your line. Look back there, and oh, yeah, you got another fish. Um, I eventually put this one out in front of me because I was catching so many fish on it <laughs> that I just kept it in the rod holder in front of me instead of behind me. But that's how you can you can uh, rig the stinger fly if you're fishing suspended. Um, I wasn't. I didn't have any chunk bait. Just this right underneath the underneath the float. Um, if you don't, I would like I use balloons because they're super cheap. You can use. There's lots of big bobbers. Just make sure that they can float as much lead as you're using. Um, something else I was going to say about that is what? Oh man, I lost track. I'm all nervous now because Justin's here. Justin's the pro at, at uh, videos. I'm going live. We got Bob here. Man, we got a couple of pros in here. And now I'm just all nervous. Um, the other thing I was going to say about this is um, if you are if you're suspended and drifting, you might consider adding that chunk bait. It adds a, uh, you know, they might hit the chunk bait. They might come to the area because of that chunk bait and then end up hitting the fly. Um, it's just a ton of fun. I didn't want the whole mess of extra fish and as many fish as I was catching. I didn't want potential of like two fish on one rod and losing the big fish or something like that. The last rig that I'm going to show you is what I used the whole second half of the day. I had one of these set up this way the entire tournament, um, but by the second half of the day when I had found the water so turbulent and I was trying to fish around all of those rocks, um, I used another version of the Carolina rig, but I used it with a dragging sinker. So this is a two ounce uh, rattlesnake uh, from Catfish Sumo. Of course, you can use any that you want, um, but I rigged that up with a rattling line float a sinker slider and a 10-aught circle hook. 
by the way, on, on my suspended rod, it was a 10 knot hook also. Lots of people call and ask us, hey, I'm fishing for channel catfish. I need a, I need a size one or a size six hook, or, or do you make a four knot? Do you make a three knot? I caught channel catfish down to 12 inches on this 10 knot hook. They have no problem getting that thing in there. So if you're ever missing a bite, I would encourage you to upsize your hook before you downsize your hook. Upsize the hook, you'll, at worst, you might miss a small fish. At best, you're gonna catch more big fish. Because if you have a hook that's too small, it'll slide out of a big fish's mouth before it hangs. But if it's too big, you can still catch the small fish. You just won't miss that bigger fish. So the way that I had rigged this is rather than having my line directly on here, I put a sinker slide on my main line. I'll, I'll do part of this, but I'm not going to show you the knots again to waste the, your time. Sinker slider on there to a swivel. And I did have a knot protector in there. Um, just because that's how I had it rigged, but but if you're using plastic like this, you don't have to worry as much about the knot protector. But this then clips to your dragging sinker. The other benefit is you can change sizes. If you have a bunch of, if you're fishing deeper or you have a bunch of current or something, you can change that size real quickly. Or at one point I had uh, anchored and was casting really far and it's harder to cast through that floppy thing. You can switch to a cannonball weight or something else, a, a bank sinker or, um, with a, like a swivel on the top. Um, so that's why I like that sinker slider because you can switch those out so easy. So uh, sinker slider to a swivel. After the swivel, I had a leader. And my leader is usually about 36 inches long. Is that 36 inches? I'm going to, I call it 36 inches. It's this distance, <laughs> whatever this is, right about 36 inches. And um, I had a rattling line fo float in there. Um, the way that I rig them, I don't put beads or knots or anything on there. I want I want this to be able to slide a little bit and I definitely don't want any knots on those pinpoints. So I just go in the front, out the back, and then I had it down right up to my hook. I probably had one inch, maybe two inches between there and, and my actual hook. So this rattle is keeping your bait up off the bottom. It's adding a little bit of noise in the water to help attract the fish. If they run by and hit it or tap at this, they're going to shake that a lot better, um, hear that, and it's going to trigger a bite. So that to my 10 knot circle hook. Um, and that was the rig that I switched to my other rods to at the end of the day because the water was so turbulent that I needed all my rods on the bottom, down where the fish were, and then my, my rod can be doing whatever it wants up here. And I left a little bit of slack in it, but it doesn't matter what my rod tip is doing because of the waves. Because down on the bottom, that sinker is holding that sinker slider to the bottom, and my bait is going to be hanging right out here. And I know it's going to be in the strike zone. I know it's the right distance from the bottom, and I know it's a way that as soon as they hit it, it's going to pull that main line, and I'm going to be able to catch the fish. So that is the end of the rigging section. For the people who are on here, if there are things that I skipped over, ran too fast over, you want to ask follow-up questions on, now's the time. Let me know. We're going to wind this thing down here in just a second. I have one more thing to add for you guys, um, but wanted to give an opportunity for any um, questions you might have. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll leave this live up for a couple days for anybody who wants to watch it later or mystics or working or whatever today. Um, I'll leave this up for a couple days and I'll come back and check comments. But if there's anything you guys want to know, I'll be happy to share. Like I said in the beginning, my, my goal in this is to share absolutely exactly my thought process strategy going in um, that, that ended up winning the tournament so that you guys can go out and do the same thing. You can win tournaments, you can catch bigger fish. I'll watch the comments here in case any other questions come in. The, the last thing that I wanted to add, th this is kind of wrapping up the end of the teaching portion. Oh, Porkchop says, what bait did you put on the spook? On um, the spook, I was, so in the very beginning, first couple of days, I had the shrimp behind that. Um, and I had a eight uh, sweeper hook, which is bent a little more, seems to be, actually, I think I have one right here. Hey, I'm back. The very first couple days of pre-fishing, I was using a sweeper hook because it fit the shape of that shrimp a little bit better. Also, it's a little bit thinner gauge versus the hangry hooks, which is a little thicker gauge and seemed to be tearing them more. Um, so I was using... <laughs> No, Justin is a great sport, and uh, Justin fished a great tournament, did an awesome job. Richard wanted to know if Justin pouted all the way home. Um, Justin actually had kind of some other things going on in life that, that kind of made it uh, um, a, a week for him.
but man, it was, it was awesome. <laughs> it's still outing, but um, I, I mean, very, very truly. And I told Justin this and I'll, I'll let you guys know too. Justin uh, encouraged me to come up to do the tournament. It was great to be able to pre-fish together for a couple of days. Um, I owe a lot of what I know and getting out and kayak fishing uh, to, to Justin. So I'm, I'm very grateful to him. Um, so, so pre-fishing to, to answer your question, uh, uh, pork chop was that I had a sweeper hook on where I was using shrimp thinner gauge wire, better shape to, to fit that hook, uh, to fit that shrimp. And that's what I was dragging behind that rattle. On tournament day, when I knew I wasn't going to be fishing with shrimp, shrimp, I ended up switching to the hangry hook. Uh, and that's when I had kind of rotating between shad and skipjack on that. Hope that helps answer that question. Anything else you guys want to know, let me know. Um, but this kind of wraps up the teaching portion of this video. Um, we, we did have some people mentioning that they wanted to get out in the kayak for the first time or um, they're interested in joining catfish kayak tournaments. If that's you, I want to encourage you to do it. There is so much incentive to join the tournament. Um, there are there are prizes for big fish. There are prizes for like a random drawing for anybody who submits a fish. Um, there's lots of ways that you can win. Um, like money, earn your money back, earn your entry fee back, make money on the tournament. Um, that that you don't don't be scared by oh man the same couple people win a bunch of tournaments. Um, I, that was a little bit of my fear going in, but man the experience was awesome. Hanging out with other people, the adventure of it, the adrenaline, the making a plan, executing the plan, seeing how it comes out, all of that is an absolute blast. So if you have tournaments around you, I would encourage you to give one a shot. Um, or if you don't have one near you, check out the, or if you, if you haven't checked, check out the online catfishing tournament trail. You can find them on Facebook, they're on Fishing Chaos um, YouTube channel as well. And look for any of those tournaments that are left. There's a couple left still for the season. And um, it's, a, it's a blast. Great tournament trail over there, professionally done. Kind of the, the um, gold, gold standard right now for kayak catfish tournaments. Um, and, and for this tournament, they had, they had partnered together with King Cats, which is why there was a bigger prize pool, maybe more attention for more anglers. Um, that's what that's what made this one such a blast and, and worth the drive up there. Just have so much fun with other people. Um, where was I headed, man? I'm all nervous now. <laughs> but anyway, so this this pretty much wraps up the teaching portion. I did want to add one more. Um, if, if you're if you're set with everything you have, you like your gear, you have your strategy, all that feel free to click away. You don't have to listen to the next part of the video. Anybody who does want to learn more about kayak catfishing, I'm going to give you two things. Um, first is absolutely check out Justin's channel. It's Kayak Catfish on YouTube. Um, there is a wealth of resources. Justin has been fishing for years and years, many days, most days out of a week on the water. He has more time in a kayak on the water catching big fish than anybody I know and very willing to share information. You can get information about bait, about rigs, about spots, the three rights he shows at every single video. Um, so it's entertaining and you can also learn a lot. Um, if you're looking for something a little more meat heavy, like, hey, I want to know, like as if I hired a guide, you know, that, that's kind of your options. You go hire a guide who shows you and they'll put you on fish, but they're not gonna teach you this stuff. They're not gonna teach you how to go out and do it the next day because they really want uh, another guide service, right? Um, so you can hire a guide for five, six, seven hundred bucks. Well, probably not that one for all day, four or five hundred dollars. Um, or, or one resource that I wanted to share with you, and, and we have a special offer just for the people who are on this video, is Justin and I recorded a course teaching you absolutely everything you need to catch big kayak, get big catfish out of a kayak. <clears throat> we recorded it right here in this room. We also have some videos outdoors. We show you rigs. We show you how to pick spots. We show you how to safely fish out of a kayak. Um, it is a comprehensive start to finish, meat heavy. It's about, I think, four, close to five hours of video content. And you can watch start to finish as if you were sitting right here with us asking us the questions. Um, that was my goal. I sat here and drilled Justin with questions. Teach us everything you know so that we can learn how to do it. Um, so we, we that course has been available now for a little over a year. It's on our website, um, uh, Catfish Sumo. But anybody who is interested in that course or Justin's signature rod, which is the rod that I use out of the kayak, it has some benefits. I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of promo stuff right now. But if you're interested in that, there is a link somewhere around this video, I believe. Like I said, first time doing it live. But somewhere around this video is a link to a um, to a page where just the people who are on this video can uh, can get a special offer, which is you can, if you buy the course, you get a free Golly Whopper signature rod. This is the Justin Johnston Diet Catfish signature rod. It comes with the boat fishing uh, handle. So 
on the end, this bolts off. So, you know, that day that I was fishing, I was able to take this bolt off and add a 12 inch extension like that. So then you have a surf style casting rod. Um, if you are needing a kayak rod or you want to learn more about catfishing out of a kayak, go check out that course, hit the link below and you can, if you get the course, you get a free rod with it. Um, that's it. That's the end of the promo thing. I promise not to, to, uh, yeah, push a whole, whole heart on, on any of that. I hope that the first hour or so of this video was super informative to you guys. Thanks for hanging out. Everybody who was here, it was a blast hanging out with you guys. If you're watching this on the replay, still feel free to post comments. We'll try to monitor them for a couple of days and help answer any questions that you might have. Um, big thanks to the online catfishing tournament trail and to King Cat for um, helping uh, with um, a lot of the sponsorship for that video. It was a blast to hang out with so many amazing anglers, really good guys. Um, competitive for sure, but also really fun to hang out with. And um, anything else that we can help you with, feel free to check us out at catfishsumo.com. If you have any questions or anything, you can email hello at catfishsumo.com. And last uh, encouragement is that anybody can go out and catch big catfish. Pay attention to the right spot, the right rig, and the right bait, and you can catch big catfish too. Thanks everybody for hanging out here, and we'll see you guys next time.